Red Alert on the Atlantic. Carrier Strike Group 8, a heavily armed naval formation headed by an aircraft carrier, is out on the Atlantic to rehearse a real case scenario. The purpose of the four-week maneuver is to practice the tactical interplay between the warships prior to engaging in combat. Three nations are involved. Any mission, anytime, anywhere, we're ready to go. The centerpiece of the group is its flagship, the carrier Harry S. Truman, a 1,093 feet long, floating small town with a military airport. With 5,600 personnel on board, the Truman can accommodate 49 jet fighters. During the exercise, its crew will handle several thousand takeoffs and landings. The physical demands are so massive that all those involved always have to push themselves to the very limit. Being out here is definitely stressful. It's a very stress-high environment. A further 1,400 naval personnel are serving on the group's destroyers and frigates. Over the next few weeks, they too will be engaged in the most demanding military exercises. Fire on board has to be combated swiftly and effectively. Medical teams have to ensure that those with injuries or burns receive prompt attention. And anyone going overboard into the cold waters of the Atlantic has to be rescued with all haste. Far away from the mainlands, the warships will fire thousands of rounds of ammunition and launch dozens of rockets. Attacks will be controlled tactically from the group's operation centers. Stress in a confined space in the tough daily routine of life in the Navy. This is your commander. Warn unidentified approaching aircraft in order to indicate our capacity for action and that of the force, over and out. To defend peace in the world's oceans. That is the reason why 7,000 sailors, soldiers, and pilots are prepared to endure four weeks of torture on the high seas. Four weeks that will see them grow together to form a powerful carrier group. The Harry S. Truman is so huge it can be seen from afar. This nuclear-powered steel colossus has been in service since 1998 and has been used for military operations in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. One of the U.S. Navy's nine carrier strike groups, the Truman is the centerpiece of every operation involving Carrier Strike Group 8. The group's command center is also located on the Truman. The Commander-in-Chief of Carrier Strike Group 8 is Admiral Eugene Black. Carrier Strike Group is a way for nations with a common purpose in the maritime world to show interest, maintain security, and ensure the free flow of commerce all over the world. Carrier Strike Group 8 consists of six warships and a submarine. At the center of the formation is its flagship, the USS Harry S. Truman, an American Nimitz-class carrier with 49 combat aircraft on board. The Truman is escorted by two U.S. Navy destroyers, the Arleigh Burke and the Jason Dunham. Like bodyguards, their job is to defend the carrier against enemy attack. The USS Normandy, an American guided missile cruiser, functions as a floating missile screen and protects the group from airstrikes. The German frigate Hessen is the eyes and the ears of the strike group. It specializes in aerial reconnaissance with a radius of 250 miles. The Roald Amundsen is a frigate that is part of the Norwegian Navy. The smallest vessel in the group, its task is to combat enemy submarines and warships.
The carrier is also escorted by a Los Angeles-class attack submarine. Its job is to protect the group by hunting down and destroying enemy submarines. The carrier group, with its 7,000 personnel, has embarked on a four-week exercise with a three-day final battle scenario. What we're doing out here is, a, is about a month-long exercise. It's very intense, and it's called Comp2X. Of course, the U.S. military has to make a funny word out of everything, but it really means is it's your graduation exam to go on deployment. So these ships and aircraft and these sailors have been working together for uh, just over a year to come together and deploy. And this month-long exercise is our final exam. The Composite Training Unit Exercise, COMP2X for short, takes place six to eight weeks prior to actual operations. It encompasses six areas of marine warfare. It's a test which all the units have to pass. All the warships involved first have to congregate at a naval base in Virginia on the east coast of the United States. Naval Station Norfolk is the biggest naval base in the world. It is from here that the U.S. Navy coordinates all its military activities in the Atlantic. Norfolk is also home port of 75 American warships, including four aircraft carriers. Every exercise, every deployment, begins at one of the 14 berths. A week before the Computex maneuver, there's a hushed air of expectation at the base. The slumbering warships are in their starting blocks. Over the next few days, the crews will go aboard and ammunition and supplies will disappear in the warship's heavily armed hulls. First and foremost, inside the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Harry S. Truman. This class of warship is equipped with two nuclear reactors, which can accelerate the 95,000-ton giant to a speed of 30 knots. 1,093 feet long and 253 feet wide, the Truman is one of the biggest vessels of its kind. A draft of 39 feet means that one-third of the ship is below the surface. To ensure that the Truman passes the four-week acid test, for several days, forklift trucks provide provisions, medical supplies, and technical equipment through the hangar gate and into the hull of the ocean giant. The volume of supplies stored here is equivalent to the daily requirements of a small town. On a daily basis, we're talking about 280 kilograms of hamburger meat, over 2,000 eggs, 800 loaves, and 350 kilograms of vegetables, along with half a ton of fruit. The Truman can store supplies for up to 90 days. And to ensure nothing is damaged in rough seas, all supplies are secured with steel chains. We are a floating city at sea. We serve as an airport. We make our own water, our propulsion. We have nine restaurants, serve over 15,000 meals a day. Besides being a gigantic pantry, the Truman is also a huge arsenal. Just before she sets sail, hundreds of missiles, shells, and bombs are stored on board. The blue-colored projectiles are practice ammunition. But these bombs, which weigh nearly a ton, are also part of the carrier's arsenal. The weapons officers keep an exact account of every bullet that goes on board. After days of tough loading work on the jetty, the Truman is now ready for action. Berthed a few meters away is the frigate Hessen, currently the German Navy's most modern system her task within the Truman Group is aerial surveillance and air defense. The officers and men of the Hessen have a worldwide reputation as reconnaissance specialists. The 
carrier group's air defense frigate, the Hessen, is 469 feet long and 59 feet wide and has a complement of 255. With a draft of only 20 feet, she can also operate effectively in coastal waters. The frigate Hessen is the newcomer in Carrier Strike Group 8. Our two nations are operating very well uh, together, and uh, I've been teaching the German officers a little bit about American football, and uh, they've been teaching me a little bit about the Bundesliga and uh, German football. So we're working very well together, and I look forward to working uh, tactically with, uh, with the German Navy in the future. Before the Hessen can put to sea, she too has to be loaded up with a month's provisions. And that is a tough job. The frigate doesn't have any loading hatches, so every container has to be transferred 460 feet into the storage area by hand via three decks. The task alone takes a whole day. We have 1,800 kilograms of fruit and vegetables on board, along with 11,000 bottles of water and some 1.2 tons of meat and fish, most of it deep frozen. The limit for staying at sea is about 21 days, simply because we also like meals to contain a lot of fresh produce, like salad and fresh vegetables. And they don't really keep longer than three weeks. In Norfolk, the big moment is approaching. Most of the crews in the strike group have boarded their warships. The most important figure in the carrier group, Admiral Jean Black, has also arrived on the quayside. The remaining crew members say goodbye to their families. They won't see them again for a half a year. For most of the personnel, the exercise will be followed by an actual tour of duty, set at six months. Uh, I'm so pleased and proud of the Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group team, 6,500 of uh, the finest Americans you could ever sail with or serve with. Uh, we're trained, we're ready, any mission, anytime, anywhere, we're ready to go. The last ties with the mainland are detached as the USS Harry S. Truman prepares to leave. The thick mooring ropes are hauled in by hand. The massive anchor chains are more of a problem. 1,083 feet long and weighing several tons, they can only be hoisted with a huge winch. Four special tugs have arrived. Its mooring is too tight for the carrier to maneuver on its own. So the tugs have come to shepherd the slow-moving giant, meter by meter, into the Norfolk Navigation Channel. Then, under its own steam, the Truman makes its way through the world's biggest naval base and out into the open sea. As yet, there's no aircraft activity on its flight deck. That's because there's a strict ban on takeoffs and landings in the port area. The command cast off has also been given on board the next warship. The maneuverable guided missile destroyer Arleigh Burke with its complement of 300 also heads out of the port complex. The Normandy is the next to leave. This guided missile cruiser has been in service with the U.S. Navy since 1989. It has a complement of 390. The Los Angeles-class submarine is also moving off. For tactical reasons, this attack submarine will remain underwater and out of sight throughout the entire maneuver. The Norwegian frigate Roald Amundsen has now also left its berth. Its crew of 120 is the smallest complement in the strike group. The second international partner, the German frigate Hessen, is the last of the warships to set sail. All the vessels in the carrier strike group 8 have now left the safety of the Norfolk naval base. The Comp 2X maneuver has started. 
A sailor on the bridge of the German frigate has spotted two speedboats on the horizon. They're attacking the Hessen. The warship has only just left port, but its crew are already given a foretaste of what to expect over the next few weeks. Both boats are accelerating. Speedboat defense. The versatile speedboats seem innocuous, but they could have dangerous weapons on board, like rocket-propelled grenades and limpet mines. On no account must they be allowed to get through to the strike group. Turn away immediately, or I will be forced to take action against you. Over. Meldung, warning, drei gelesen, auf beide Speedboote keine Response. Waffe optisch, Waffe optisch. The Hessen's gunners now have the boats in their sights. The aggressive tapping stimulates the salvos from the light naval gun on the deck. The threat has been eliminated and the exercise completed successfully. In an actual attack, the commander and his crew would have to go through the sequence of actions as if they were second nature. Otherwise, it could quickly be too late for the frigate and the carrier. Out on the Atlantic, the Harry S. Truman is on course for its exercise area. With a top speed of 32 knots, the Nimitz-class aircraft carriers are among the world's fastest warships. Its 276,000 horsepower engines are now propelling the carrier at full speed through tight curves taken at an angle of 15 degrees. The two nuclear reactors driving the ship's four giant propellers are working at maximum output. This particular maneuver constitutes a massive stress test for the rigid Colossus. Engineers on board the carrier carry out regular checks for any cracks or deformations. We anticipate that uh, Nimitz-class aircraft carrier will stay operational for a service life of 50 years. Truman is coming up on about halfway through its service life, uh, but we will continue in the normal rotation of training, uh, deployments, returning for maintenance, refit, retraining, uh, and continue on. So a very bright future for Harry S. Truman and the Harry S. Truman uh, strike group as we continue uh, to operate uh, for the missions that we were designed for. First, though, some hard work lies ahead for the Truman's crew. They're awaiting the arrival of 49 combat jets, the steel giant's main weapon. Without its fighter squadron, the carrier would be virtually defenseless. The Boeing F-18 Super Hornet is the fighter aircraft of the U.S. Navy and at the same time the backbone of the Truman's carrier air wing. After taking off from several military bases on the mainland, the fighter pilots have flown up to 3,100 miles. Since that is more than double the range of a Super Hornet, the fighters have had to be refueled in midair. The airspace above the Truman is slowly filling up. It's an extremely tense time for all those involved. The carrier is sailing into the wind to make landing easier for the pilots. Its runway would never be long enough for the aircraft to come to a normal standstill, so technical aids are essential. Just 820 feet in length, the runway on the Truman is extremely short so four safety or arresting wires are tensioned right across the flight deck. They can bring a jet to a standstill in just two seconds. Attached to each aircraft is a tail hook, which snags one of the steel cables on landing. Hitting a two inch thick steel cable with a 15 ton jet while landing at 155 miles per hour on a floating runway that is far too short is always an ordeal for the pilot. It involves precision work in all weathers, from the teams on deck, too. That's why there are clear dress regulations on the Truman's flight deck. To indicate their various responsibilities, the teams wear different colored shirts. Each color represents a specific task area. The yellow shirts, for instance, allocate the pilot a parking position.
To make it more maneuverable on deck, the F-18 was designed with folding wings. This feature greatly reduces the normal wingspan of 39 feet. The next Super Hornet is now ready to land. The pilot has extended the five feet long tail hook. His wingman checks to see that it has been fully extended. The jet fighter then approaches the runway. The sailors in green also belong to the 400 personnel on the flight deck, known as hook runners. They make sure the safety wires are tensioned after every landing. The wires are positioned 39 feet apart to ensure that every jet is arrested. The pilot is now coming in to land. He's assisted by the men in white. The landing signal officers, or LSOs, are themselves pilots and are in permanent radio contact with their colleague in the cockpit. They guide him onto the optimum approach for snagging one of the arresting wires. One after another, the jets land at one minute intervals. This is a real acid test for the arresting system on board the Truman. Its wires are connected directly to a huge hydraulic cylinder. The braking system braces itself against the force from the jet and brings the aircraft to a standstill. Landing on an aircraft carrier is literally a balancing act. Ideally, a pilot will snag the second safety wire. Even for particularly experienced pilots, the pinpoint navigating requires enormous concentration. This Super Hornet is flying too high, but its tail hook just manages to snag the last wire. Here, just a few inches make the difference between coming to an abrupt stop and having to give full throttle. When a pilot misses all the arresting wires, the situation is critical. The runway then becomes a takeoff ramp. The pilot has to perform a go-around, known in the Navy as a bolter. This happens in five to 10% of all landings. For safety reasons, a tanker aircraft is already waiting. Because after the botched attempt at landing, the jet's fuel gauge needle is in the red zone. But now, 3,000 liters a minute are flowing into the F-18's fuel tanks. The pilot is ready to make a second attempt. This time, the landing is successful. After the Super Hornets have landed, the remaining members of the carrier air wing come in and are parked. The 21,500 square yards of the Truman's flight deck are now jam-packed. Every Nimitz-class carrier can take up to 85 aircraft, but the number is slightly less for the requirements of the Comptoex exercise. We have 44 strike fighter aircraft, F-18 Super Hornets, this uh, air wing is unique in that our air wing is comprised solely of F-18 Super Hornets uh, with advanced radars and advanced capabilities. Uh, along with that, we have two helicopter squadrons that perform different functions. We have five uh, E-18G Growlers, those advanced electronic attack aircraft, and we also have the five E-2Ds. The Truman cost around four and a half billion dollars. And each day this floating airfield is in operation costs a further two and a half million dollars. The aircraft carrier is protected by six steel bodyguards. Depending on the scenario, to realize their full effectiveness, the destroyers and frigates are moved around like figures on a chessboard. The group is limited only by the dimensions of the Atlantic training area. The virtual war zone is projected onto the ocean like a slide. The artificial operations map resembles the Mediterranean and the Middle East. 
the fictional Comptuex area of operation is subdivided into several sections or boxes. In these boxes, the ships have to comply with certain rules. Think of the boxes like this. Last night we came here from the north. We relocated south into the more northerly of the two boxes, each of which is roughly 37 to 50 miles in area. We're now moving further south to enable our helicopter to take off. This box is roughly the same size, but of a slightly different shape. It is already off limits for other exercises. This is where the ships that are involved in other operations will fire afterwards. And down here, our helicopter will be able to take off safely. We've now got half an hour left to get there. We're traveling straight there at top speed to rendezvous with the Norwegians, who will accept our helicopter as soon as it has taken off. To prevent the group presenting an easy target, after passing through canals or straits, for example, the ships will separate immediately and operate in an extended formation, often dozens of miles apart. The group's helicopters go into action whenever technical staff, medical supplies, munitions or provisions have to be exchanged between vessels. Here, a German helicopter is transporting two technicians from the Truman to a destroyer, which is having problems with its air conditioning system. The guided missile destroyer Arleigh Burke is something very special and has thus lent its name to an entire vessel class, which currently consists of more than 65 structurally identical destroyers. They were the first naval vessels to be built with stealth technology. Arleigh Burke class destroyers are 509 feet long have a width of 66 feet and a draft of some 33 feet. This makes them extremely stable even in heavy seas. Their 99,000 horsepower engines give the destroyers a top speed of 30 knots. The Arleigh Burks each have 300 personnel on board. Arleigh Burke destroyers are equipped with a complex electronically controlled combat system which makes them ideal for protecting carriers like the Truman from aerial and submarine attack. Headed by Commander Jason T. Stepp, the team on the bridge is rotated to ensure that the warship is ready to defend the carrier at all times during the exercise. It's an amazing capability that we have on this ship with the uh, latest combat systems upgrade in the United States Navy. Uh, and we bring a lot of capability to that strike group and ultimately to the combatant commander uh, when deployed. To present as low a radar cross-section as possible, all the outer surfaces and deck superstructures were designed in line with stealth principles. Arleigh Burke is a, a multi-mission capable destroyer. Uh, so we're capable of conducting uh, anti-submarine warfare, anti-service warfare, uh, air and missile defense, uh, both of ourselves and of a strike group, so point and area defense. Uh, we're also very capable in uh, ballistic missile defense. According to the maneuver map, the Arleigh Burke is moving in enemy waters. In reality, things would now be really tight for the destroyer. Several islands are making it hard for the warship to maneuver. The destroyer would thus be an easy target for land-based forces. But steps have already been taken to combat this. A unique capability of us is, uh, for us, based on uh, our ele upgraded electronic system, is that we can control steering from multiple locations uh, throughout the ship so that we have redundancy in the event that there is a loss of steering. The warship is designed like a gigantic labyrinth. Countless bulkheads protect it from serious damage and make it hard for any enemy to advance through to the bridge. The crew can only get straight from the stem to the stern via the Zulu deck deep in the bowels of the ship. This is also where the system rooms and the offices are located, along with the mess where meals are served. So four times a day, there is something of a crush here. Arleigh Burke uh, is home to about 300 sailors, uh, and uh, four times a day, we uh, produce 300 or so meals for the crew. So you think about you know, the ship's galleys putting out you know, a restaurant-sized 
uh, 1,200 meals a day uh, for the crew on board. So a pretty monumental feat, and a lot of credit goes to the, the culinary folks on board that, that you know, work to get that together and make sure the crew is very well fed and taken care of. The destroyer's turbines are just as hungry as its crew. On average, they consume 100 tons of diesel oil a day. Since the Second World War, more Arleigh Burke destroyers have been built for the U.S. Navy than virtually any other class of warship. Their combat systems make them extremely effective, especially in difficult defense scenarios. The Arleigh Burke is a fighting machine. It has eight harpoon missile systems for combating enemy warships six torpedo tubes for attacking submarines, and a 127 millimeter cannon that can sink speedboats in seconds. And any attackers still managing to penetrate through to the warship can expect to be met with a heavy barrage from the Siwas phalanx. But the main weapon on board the Arleigh Burke is its guided missile system. With rockets fired from 90 launch cells, the destroyer can combat attacks from air, land, and sea. Its vertical launch system enables the destroyer to attack bunker installations as much as 600 miles away. Missiles fired by this high-tech warship can also combat supersonic fighter aircraft and near-Earth satellites with great accuracy. The Phalanx Seawis is an automatic, rapid-fire system. Firing 50 rounds a second, six rotating barrels literally pulverize any airborne object attacking the ship. Naval engineers are constantly working on improving the Arleigh Burke's defense systems. These include a computerized missile defense system known as RAM, short for Rolling Airframe Missile. The Super Airbox system launches chaff or infrared decoys to foil anti-ship missiles. The destroyer's Bushmaster M242 autocannon and its 127 millimeter lightweight gun are used against targets close to the shore. The Arleigh Burke's defense systems are complemented by a complex electronic tracking system. Its core element is the Aegis combat system, a combination of radar, sonar, and sensor technology that can track and guide weapons to destroy targets in the air and at sea. A high-performance sonar system in the Arleigh Burke's bulbous bow detects all movements underwater. It can also register objects on the surface up to 124 miles away. In order to determine the precise nature of an object, the signals from it are compared with the information stored in a huge echo data bank. The warship also has a 360-degree radar system that can even detect objects no bigger than a golf ball 112 miles away. The two radar units at the stern transmit a signal which guides missiles fired by the ship precisely to their target. In addition, Numerous antennas ensure pinpoint navigation of the vessel itself. Within the carrier group, the Arleigh Burke is clearly designed as what is known as a multi-mission platform. In defending the Truman, it can assume several roles. And then part of the uh, Comp2X that we're in right now, uh, operating with the, uh, the aircraft carrier and our joint partners, is proving that capability uh, in a joint cooperative environment.
This particular morning, the fighter aircraft on board the USS Harry S. Truman are being positioned on its flight deck because Admiral Eugene Black has a complex air surveillance exercise planned for today. The carrier's human machine clockwork is starting to tick. First of all, the Hawkeyes take off, to be followed by the F-18 fighter jets. The aim is to fill the airspace above the carrier strike group and then monitor it in coordination with all the units in the group. For the deck crews, this is pressure time. The yellow shirts guide each jet to its takeoff position. The green shirts operate the catapult, which hurls the Super Hornets into the sky. With the help of the catapult, the F-18 reaches a speed of 124 miles per hour in just over one second. The jets take off into the Atlantic sky at a rate of one a minute. All the cog wheels of the Truman clockwork have intermeshed to perfection. The first phase of the maneuver has now been completed. This warship ensures that the jets are able to operate safely over the Atlantic. The Hessen is a Zaxxon-class frigate with the German Navy. This type of warship has been designed in such a way that it can defend itself independently in a naval conflict. The Hessen is the hawk among the group's warships. Its numerous high-tech radar systems make the Hessen a specialist in air reconnaissance. The Hessen is Germany's most powerful and most expensive weapon system. What makes it so expensive is its sensor technology, the radar systems we have on board. When we leave Wilhelmshaven, we can monitor the airspace over Frankfurt and London simultaneously. This gives us a good picture of the situation, which we can then make available to NATO, but also to the aircraft carrier. The Smart L at the stern is a rotating radar system. It enables the Hessen to establish a giant monitoring dome over the entire carrier group. Around a thousand targets within a radius of 249 miles can be detected and tracked simultaneously. Located in the frigate's tower is the APAR, Missile Guidance System. Its sensor arrays can track 250 different air targets at a distance of 93 miles. At the same time, the system can transmit the coordinates directly to the weapon systems for precise targeting. Underwater detection is no problem for the Hessen either. The high performance sensor in the bulbous bow monitors all activity in the ocean in a radius of up to 27 miles. The frigate's two helicopters extend its detection capability. Equipped with dipping sonars, they can monitor the ocean many miles beyond the Hessen's radius of activity. All data flow into the operations center, giving Commander Pfennig and his 255-person crew an up-to-the-minute and extremely precise overview of the entire situation in the air and on and below the surface. The Hessen is a group air defense frigate specializing in anti-air warfare. The vessel's defense capabilities are multidimensional. It can combat targets in the air, on the surface, and underwater. Located deep in the bowels of the ship is the operations center. Here, Pfennig and his team are totally self-sufficient. Decoupled, well-sprung, and protected by extremely thick armor plating, the center can even withstand the shocks from missiles hitting the ship. The operations center also has its own separate supply of power and oxygen. It would continue to function even if the Hessen were in flames. 
The operation center is the ship's brain, so to speak. All data interchanged within the carrier group is gathered here. Think in terms of a high seas computer network. The Hessen can not only see and hear extremely well, it can also hit hard. The frigate has six different weapon systems for defense. With a range of five miles, the 76 millimeter cannon on the bow can fire 100 rounds a minute. Two ram launchers protect the Hessen against aerial attack. Eight harpoon missile systems can attack enemy warships and two triple launchers provide torpedo defense against submarines. The 32 cells of the vertical launch system make the frigate a dangerous destroyer. The crew also have access to various firearms for close range defense. A high-tech frigate, the Hessen is the German Navy's pride and joy. Since 2010, ships of the Sachsen class are regularly part of the fighting force around the aircraft carrier Harry S. Truman. In operation only a few miles further north is the KNM Roald Amundsen, a frigate belonging to the Royal Norwegian Navy. She's the strike group submarine hunter. The ship's networked, multifunction combat system enables it to simultaneously detect, pursue, and combat underwater attackers. 440 feet long and 56 feet wide, this sub-hunter has two powerful diesel engines and a gas turbine which generate 39,450 horsepower. With a 16-feet draft and a top speed of 27 knots, the Amundsen is extremely fast and maneuverable. The smallest warship in the strike group, the Amundsen, is an integral part of Norway's powerful high-tech fleet. Belonging to the Fridjof Nansen class, it specializes in hunting submarines in the fjords of the far north and in the Atlantic. Because of the Amundsen's sporty shape, the Norwegians also fondly refer to it as the yacht. During the four-week Kamptuex maneuver, the Roald Amundsen will protect the group's flanks. In the event of a surface attack, the ship's remote-controlled Browning machine guns are brought into action. So it has to be totally ready in an emergency. Like the crews of all the warships in the carrier strike group, during the exercise, the Norwegians practice firing projectile weapons. On board the frigate during the exercise are 120 men and women. They constitute the smallest crew within the carrier strike group. With more and more technology functioning automatically, fewer hands are needed. The advantage for the crew is less stress and more space on board. Depending on its mission, the Amundsen also has 30 members of Norway's special forces on board. The frigate's speedboats transport the troops at top speed to their operational areas on the coast. The Norwegian warship also has two helicopters on board. This cruiser is another member of the Harry S. Truman Carrier Group. The USS Normandy is a floating missile base. Its vertical launch system, VLS for short, is one of the world's fastest missile launch systems. Five different types of missile can be fired from the Normandy. 568 feet long and almost 56 feet wide, 
The Normandy is a guided missile cruiser with a draft of just over 33 feet. The twin propellers are driven by a 78,906 horsepower engine that gives the warship a top speed of 30 knots. The carrier strike group is now in the middle of its four-week war maneuver. Each of the units is operating in its particular task area. The group's 7,000 sailors and air crews are waiting for their next test, which could come at any moment. In the days ahead, they will face some tough challenges. Is our final exam. We'll be certified, and once that certification, that graduation is complete, uh, we're able to go on deployment uh, whenever directed uh, by the president. So far, things are going well. I think we're going to pass, and uh, we've got a few more weeks to go. Those weeks will prove a really tough test, especially for the Truman's deck crews. The exercise schedule will involve hundreds of takeoffs and landings by fighter aircraft over a short period of time. The F-18 jets are in the air day and night and have to assume constantly changing roles in the maneuvers. Sometimes they're a friend and at others the foe. In this way, a genuine combat situation is created which the entire carrier group has to handle together. This air defense exercise, ADEX for short, is the most important element in the entire multinational maneuver. Surface defense is also part of the program. The group is attacked time and time again from all sides. The sailors have to detect, pursue, and combat enemy speedboats and warships with total precision. In Gun X, a gunnery exercise involving shooting at targets on the surface, the group's high-tech weapons are fired till they're hot. During the course of Comp2X, the stress levels of the crew are constantly rising. The call, man overboard, goes out time and again. Dinghies are launched and rescue teams enter the water. On the high seas, every second counts in saving human life. At the same time, there's fire and injured sailors on board. The crews rescue the wounded and fight the flames under realistic conditions. For everyone involved, the program means tough weeks on the high seas. From here on, the seven vessels and their complement of 7,000 men and women will give everything to ensure that the U.S. Navy's come to X maneuver is a success. Because only then will they be able to prevail in actual warfare. And that is the goal of Carrier Strike Group 8. <laughs>